Gerda Klein has been to Newburgh, Indiana, after I heard her speak a second time. And I use her book in my classes. All my freshmen read this. And we've gotten to be friends. She's been to our house for dinner. I've been to her house for breakfast in Phoenix. She's been to Castle High School. She spoke to an auditorium full of people. And it was just, it was amazing. I still can't believe it. It was the year 2000. In the audience that night were two men who had come over from southern Illinois, and they'd been American GIs, and they happened to be the American troops that, were, that liberated Gerda and her friends when they were at, at the end of World War II. It was, it was incredible. She said to them, thank you. You saved my life. It was, it was amazing. Well, since then, that hearing, her, hearing Gerda Klein. Oh, one other thing about this book. Uh, this is a book I talk about all the time. And you all know our dear Mrs. Owen. And she was quite interested in, in the work that I was doing. And I told her about this book. And we happened to be over here on a Friday night. I had the book, and I, I gave it to her. I said, I want you to read this. And she said, oh, yes. She called me the next morning. She said, I stayed up all night reading the book. <laughs> and it was just, that's always very special to me. Well, since I met Gerda Klein, I've taken trips to Europe and Poland to visit camps, to learn more, to talk to people that were there, who were there. Um, I've also had the great good fortune to, to study at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, in Israel, for two summers. And that was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. We had a topic a day. One day it was children. Another day it was Jewish doctors in the Holocaust and the dilemmas that they faced. Another day it was anti-Semitism. And the scholars would come, and there were about 25 of us. And we, um, one of my classmates called it death by lecture, but I don't think that's what it was. It was just, it was just great. Uh, as Jeannie said, I became a museum teacher fellow or a Mandel fellow at the museum, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in 2001, and I continue to work with them. I also work with the National Catholic Center for Holocaust Education. And this summer, I'll be going to the Memorial Library in New York City, where a couple of Columbia University professors will have a seminar and will become part of a Holocaust educators network nationwide. The problem is that this is not, it's not prevalent in our schools. It's not a subject that is studied in all schools. When I went to school, we didn't even talk about it. It was a long time ago. And people, it was too new, I think, and too, too fresh. And people didn't want to talk about it. But uh, even now, we don't talk about it enough with the new standards and the testing, 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 there's not as much time in the curriculum for these things that I think make us human beings, which is a problem. Well, anyway, the, the project at USC, which I am going to talk about tonight, Jeannie, don't worry about that, but I just didn't bring all that curriculum stuff. The, uh, what I'm working with at USC is the Visual History Foundation. And this is the, the foundation that was the archive that was started by Steven Spielberg after he made the movie Schindler's List. He went to Poland, and in Krakow, you can still see the Schindler, the Schindler factory is still there. And you can see it, and they did some of the filming there. And Steven Spielberg had grown up in Arizona uh, for, for a lot of his childhood. And he... He's about the same age I am. He didn't study it in school. He didn't know a lot about it. And he found the story, though, and wanted to make this movie. And what happened to him in Poland is that survivors would keep coming up to him and saying, thank you for telling the story, through an interpreter. Thank you for telling the story. And he started thinking about the story. And he realized that the story was being lost. And so he, with his great resources, started collecting testimonies. 
And between the late 90s and 2003, they stopped collecting Holocaust testimonies. And they had testimonies from liberators, from people who happened to live in the town, from survivors, children of survivors. They collected 52,000 testimonies from all over the world. And now there is this huge archive of film. And now what, how can it be used? How can we get from USC, where it's now housed, out to the public, to the schools, to community groups? And that is what we're working on out at USC. Well, first of all, why is it so important? Why are those visual testimonies so important? And one, one place that made me realize this, I was in a seminar with about eight other teachers. And this was at the uh, Seton Hill at the National Catholic Center for Holocaust Education. And eight of us had been working together online for over a year. And then we came together. And the first thing that the person running the program asked us, how did you become passionate about this subject? Because she said, that's who I, I tried to get people who were not just teaching it, but who were passionate about teaching it. Eight out of eight of us said, hearing a survivor, seeing that face, hearing that voice, seeing the survivor. And we also realized, even in 2003, that our our chances to hear survivors are running out. You know, time marches on. Gerda Klein just turned 88. She still goes out on the road. Last fall, she had a knee replacement and a pacemaker put in. Then she went out to speak. She is a survivor in every way. Um, so, but, I, but our time is running out, and so this, this Visual History Foundation is so important. We have in Evansville, Steve said, be sure you talk about that. We have in Evansville a collection of 115, that was our original, I think we're up to about 125 now, visual testimonies from the show of foundation. And you can go and you can check them out and you can watch them. You can invite this person into your living room, so to speak, and you can sit there and listen to them. The, the uh, testimony that I'm going to talk about tonight, the one I've been working with, is six hours long. And it's fascinating. You'll love, you will love every minute of it. Did anyone here happen to go to Brundabar when it was in Evansville? It was 2005 and 2011. You missed it? <laughs> it was wonderful. Um, sorry, but it really was. So, but anyway, her, her testimony is six hours long. Now, how do I use that in the classroom? How could I bring that in and bring her to my students and let them see what an amazing person she is and hear what she has to say? And the answer is that we have to do some ethical editing and thinking and putting, the, putting clips together that help our lessons. And that's what I've been working on and my interest because of Brundabar, we have done Brundabar. As I say, we worked with the Evansville Philharmonic, the Cypress Group, and we had a production in 2005, and we had one in 2011. But I started thinking about spiritual resistance and how, yes? At the end, because I'm afraid if I, OK, save that thought. All right. Um, what I started thinking about was spiritual resistance. Because when I hear Ella Weisberger, that's who you're going to hear tonight. And when also in there are examples in this book, when the people could find a way to deal with their surroundings using spiritual resistance, it just made life so much better for them. It didn't guarantee that they would survive, but it made life easier for them. First of all, a definition, spiritual resistance is not religion, although religion may be part of it. It is, sp spiritual resistance is maintaining dignity and humanity in the face of efforts to degrade them. One of my students this year said, it is 
the act of staying strong and knowing who you are, no matter what is done to you or what is said about you. And I thought that was pretty good for a 15-year-old. And there are different kinds of spiritual resistance that you'll find in, in the memoirs of the survivors. Primo Levi, who's one of the most more famous uh, Holocaust survivors, he wrote Survival in Auschwitz, he talks about spiritual resistance as just the act of staying clean, just the act of just taking care of himself physically. Soon after arriving in Auschwitz, he lost his desire to even stay clean. This is from his book. Washing seemed pointless in these filthy surroundings. It was difficult and inconvenient at best and ridiculous and even painful at worst. An older veteran prisoner advised him, quote, precisely because this camp is a great machine to reduce us to beasts, we must not become beasts. Even in this place, one can survive to tell the story, to bear witness, and that to survive, we must force ourselves to save at least the skeleton, the scaffolding, the form of civilization. We are slaves, deprived of every right, exposed to every insult, condemned to certain death, but we still possess one power, and we must defend it with all our strength, for it is the last, the power to refuse our consent. So we must certainly wash our faces without soap, in dirty water, and dry ourselves on our jacket. We must polish our shoes, not because the regulation states it, but for dignity and propriety. We must walk erect without dragging our feet, not in homage to Prussian discipline, but to remain alive, not to begin to die. There was also religious, um, spiritual resistance that was religious. People would secretly observe their holy days. There were secret synagogues in some of the camps. Of one Hanukkah where they, they found a potato, and these are people who are starving, and instead of eating it, they carved a menorah and they had what looked like a Hanukkah menorah for their Hanukkah celebration. And so that's a form of spiritual resistance. What I'm interested in is the music and the art and the poetry. <laughs>